Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats. Please find your seats. We are about to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, please join in welcoming Kent Emerson, the president of the Empire Club, to the stage. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. From Arcadian Court in downtown Toronto, welcome to the Empire Club of Canada. For those of you just joining us through either our webcast or podcast, welcome to the meeting. I'm pleased to introduce today's topic, the challenge of our generation, building a modern, sustainable Ontario government. Today, the Empire Club welcomes the President of the Ontario Treasury Board. For those of you who may not know, the Treasury Board has had a long history in Ontario. It started in 1886 as a cabinet committee with no permanent staff. The demands on government created by the Second World War drew calls for a supporting structure to increase capacity for decision making. A secretariat was finally created in 1962 having two main functions. Number one, to support the Treasury Board Committee, and number two, to provide budgetary advice to ministries and agencies of government. In the 70s, it was renamed Management Board after taking up human resources and procurement. And in, 90, in the early 90s, it was called the Treasury Board once again and became more substantial in size. But in, the, in 95, the Secretariat was completely dissolved and the board continued to operate, now supported by the Ministry of Finance. It wasn't until 2014 that it was reestablished in Ontario. The new structure was modeled after the Prime Minister Harper's design of the Secretariat in Ottawa. Only in Ontario it had much broader powers. The thought was that by giving a minister an independent role focused on the expense side of the ledger, the finance minister would be freed up to focus on provincial revenues, policy goals affecting the broader Ontario economy. This formula worked well at the federal level and it continues to be used in Ottawa to this day for this very reason. And Premier Ford's government also made the decision to retain this structure, one of the few ministries that remained untouched by the significant restructuring that occurred across cabinet portfolios. I have to say, I do not envy Minister Bethan Falvey's position and the challenges that come with it. When he gets up in the morning, he has to think about how to coordinate the entire list of ministry expenditures for the province. Do so that will, in a way that will support the government's plans. His predecessor in 1886 may have faced similar challenges, but let's just say the scale was a bit different. They did not have to contend with an expenditure projection inherited by a previous government in the neighborhood of $158 billion. This is the number as listed in the 2008 Ontario budget. Because of the internal focus of this role, it has been said in political circles that the Treasury Board Minister does not enjoy his share of the media attention or recognition outside the Queen's Park bubble. But in light of this particular minister's high personal profile and the much anticipated results of the EY Canada's line-by-line -line review of government spending, released at the end of September, Minister Bethan Falvey has been at the spotlight far more than any of his predecessors. And we haven't even got to the sunshine list yet. <laughs> People are certainly interested in this review called Managing Transformations, a modernization, act, modernization Action Plan for Ontario. That's because people understand it's a blueprint for all major decisions for government spending in the next four years. It will assist the government, it'll assist the government in their stated goals when making decisions on transfer, transformation programs and services, including sustainability, value for money, modernization, productivity, and innovation. Minister Bethan Falvey himself has been quoted as saying, it's incumbent on this government to provide the quality of services that Ontario expects, but at a better price point, unquote. There are certain opportunities to do that, but there are also challenges. The financial accountability officer has said that Ontario has the second lowest per capita spending amongst provinces and the lowest per capita revenues. It's clear that people are interested in this plan but people are also interested in this minister. That's something we learned at the Empire Club. Minister, let's just say there's been a significant amount of Beth and Falvia going on around here. 
there has been some very enthusiastic individuals who want to attend this lunch. They do not seem to be deterred by the large sold out banner on our website that was posted on, on your photo over three weeks ago. They were not deterred by the emails apologizing for the lack of ability. And so minister today, I think you will find that you have a keen audience. So let's not keep them waiting, shall we? In June, Peter Bethan Falvey was elected MPP for the riding of Pickering Uxbridge. Subsequently, he was appointed President of the Treasury Board Secretary by Premier Doug Ford. An internationally renowned figure in the financial services sector, he draws upon 25 years of senior leadership experience in capital markets, risk management, and investments. He has served as co-president at DBRS Limited, where he manages the team that downgraded Ontario's short and long-term debt ratings in 2009. He started his career at TD in New York, where he ultimately served as president and chief operating officers at TD Securities. Passionate about making a difference in his community, Peter believes in giving back and making a difference through organizations like True Patriot Love Foundation. In 2014, along with 24 leaders and 12 injured soldiers, he skied 100 kilometers to the magnetic North Pole, collectively raising $2 million for critical programs that support service men, women, veterans, and their families. Peter has an extensive experience working with boards, including the boards, Board of Crohn's and Colitis Canada. Minister Bethan Falvey is not new to politics and has been involved for over 30 years, cutting his teeth working for former Federal Finance Minister Wilson. Peter holds a Bachelor of Science and Masters of Business, administration degrees from McGill University, and a Masters of Arts in Political Science from the University of Toronto. He is a recent graduate of the Rotman School ICD board program. Peter is married to his wife Paula and is the proud father of three children. On behalf of the Empire Club of Canada, put your hands together to welcome the President of the Ontario Treasury Board, the Honourable Peter Bethenfalvey. Well, thank you, uh, Kent. And I always, when someone uh, gives that kind of a, a positive uh, introduction, I always wish my mother and father were listening because they wouldn't believe any of it. Um, but thank you, Kent. It's an honor to be here at the Empire Club. I, I'm looking at the audience. It is a big audience. It's almost as big as the audience that showed up for my uh, leaving my previous employer to come to government, but I think most of them showed up to make sure I was leaving. Um, before, I take, uh, before I go into my remarks, I want to acknowledge uh, a couple of my colleagues here. Um, first off, the Minister of Environment, Cons Conservation and Parks, Rod Phillips. He's also my twin brother being in uh, the, uh, the MPP for Ajax right next door and is doing an outstanding job. Also our great Minister of Education who's leading the province's transformation of the curriculum and particular focus which I'm really proud of on math and the STEM for both boys and girls starting in K to 12 and she's going to lead that trans transformation, the Minister of Education Lisa Thompson. So thank you for being here. And uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, my all-star parliament, parliamentary assistant, uh, Stan Cho. He's so good that he somehow finagled winning a bottle of wine today, <laughs> Stan Cho, from uh, MPP for Willowdale. <clears throat> but I'd also like to recognize, uh, this may uh, catch her off guard, but Karen Hughes, um, who has stepped into the role of Acting Deputy Minister for Treasury Board Secretariat in the last month her and her team have done yeoman's work in leading our ministry and indeed the multi-year uh, multi planning process which is a really a Herculean effort that we engage in in government in order to modernize and transform government. For those of you who don't know, Karen is actually the former Canadian women's hockey coach and led the team to victory in the 2002 Salt Lake City Olympics. So the cat's out of the bag, gold medal. <laughs> So of course, I've never even won bronze, so that's a pretty high bar to, to follow. But this is the type of uh, caliber of person that we have leading our team at Treasury Board, and we're fortunate to have her. You know, the Empire Club is, uh, is well known for fostering important discourse, and you've had, although I'm pretty sure most people weren't here, you've had Winston Churchill and Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, and as a conservative, you might ex expect that I would quote someone like that. But I'd like to begin my speech with a quote from someone else. Someone who, as we consider the fiscal situation and the task ahead, 
um, gave some words that actually give me some solace, and that is uh, another speaker from the Empire Club, actress Audrey Hepburn, who once said, and I really like this, nothing is impossible. In fact, the word itself is, I'm possible. And I think that's the, the approach that this government is taking, that really, we're not looking at the impossible, we're looking at what is possible on behalf of the taxpayers of Ontario. So been, since being elected, um, our government for the people led by Premier Doug Ford, has focused on five clear priorities that sit at the foundation of all our commitments. And I think it's worth repeating these five commitments frequently because it drives everything we do in government. First, we pledge to put more money in the pockets of the people of Ontario by cancelling the cap and trade tax, lowering gas prices, and home heating bills, which are lower now. Our government has also taken immediate steps to freeze driver's license fees and the cancellation of the Drive Clean program. Although I teased Rod and I say, why did it take you so long? But about 90 days. Thanks to the efforts uh, of my friend and colleague, Minister Rod Phillips, our government is also playing a leadership role on the national stage in the fight against the regressive job-killing federal carbon tax. So I thank you to Rod for that. Second, we promised to clean up the hydro mess, and it was important, and I think people underestimated how quickly the Premier would act on this, and was one of the first things that our government did uh, to change the leadership at Hydro One, and I can tell you that was one of the major irritants in my constituents, and I've got some of my constituents here today, uh, at the doors was the hydro prices. That was often first, second, and third, and the action that this government took immediately to start the process of cleaning up the hydro mess. Third, and as important, we are focused on creating and protecting sustainable, good jobs in Ontario. And let me tell you, we are well underway with our legisla legislation to kill the job-killing parts of Bill 148 while winding down the Ontario of trades. And I often like to think we've put up the Ontario is open for business signs. Um, that we, we, we had to first take down the Ontario is the red tape capital of, Ontario, of the North America signs first. to put up the Ontario's open for business signs. And these are real things. Uh, the College of Trades, we're just getting tremendous uh, response for that to help our youth get, get jobs and employers who need jobs in the trade sector. Fourth, we promise to end healthcare hallway medicine. And on this, I would note that Minister Christine Elliott and her team has already announced that our government is opening 6,000 new long-term beds, along with an historic surge funding of an additional 1,000 additional spaces to help reduce the strain from the flu season. But the priority that I would like to talk about the most today is about restoring accountability, trust, and transparency in government. And let's not sugarcoat it. We inherited a, a monumental fiscal crisis from the previous Liberal government, one that, left unchecked, imperils the core services of government. We are determined to rise to this challenge. Minister Vic Fidelli, who is our finance minister, will share some of the solution next week when he introduce, introduces our government's, uh, our government's first fall economic statement. For my part, I want to talk about the steps our government will take to restore trust, accountability and transparency by harnessing the power of transformation and modernization. Let's begin looking at the scale of the financial challenge we inherited from the previous Liberal government. Even getting accurate information about the province's financial position proved to be an immense challenge. As we know, the Liberals actively understated that what was, in fact, a growing structural deficit. Whether we are talking about trying to undermine the Auditor General in order to apply jointly sponsored pension assets to the province's revenues, or going to phenomenal lengths to obfuscate the hydro subsidy subsidies off book as part of their fair hydro scheme, the previous government left the credibility of the province's financial accountability in tatters. And certainly on these points, we owe a debt of gratitude to the Auditor General. She showed uh, outstanding diligence and sophistication in identifying accounting practices that did not meet proper fiduciary standards. 
One of our first decisions in government when we announced we would strike an independent financial commission of inquiry into the previous government's budget practices alongside an external line-by-line -line review of all government was one of our top priorities. And let me tell you, the numbers are sobering. The inquiry really revealed that under the previous government, <clears throat> Ontario's debt has reached a staggering $338 billion and a $15 billion deficit for the current year. And I pause when I, you know, we read $338 billion. That's a third of a trillion. And our deficit, $15 billion, if unchecked, will say it get us close to almost half a trillion of debt in our first mandate. In just 15 years, our debt to GDP ratio, and I, I see some of my former colleagues from DBRS who know that the debt to GDP is a benchmark of the health of the province. And the previous Treasury Board President that you talked about, Kent, I didn't know it was uh, back to 1800s, but Deb Matthews publicly stated that no government should go over 40%. That was a red line. We inherited a debt to GDP of 40.5%. In fact, in 2003, the debt to GDP was 27% and is now 40.5%. Our province is the most indebted subnational jurisdiction on the planet. And rising debt to GDP has resulted in multiple credit rating agency downgrades, of which, yes, my team, uh, some of whom are over there in 2009, downgraded, followed by Standards and Poor's and others. Currently, Ontario spends more on interest payments, around $12.5 billion, than we spend on the whole Ontario public service, and more than we spend on the whole post-secondary education system. That means we are spending approximately $1.4 million on interest every hour. And I did a quick calculation. That means that this, during this lunch, we'll have spent $2 million on interest alone. So I, I implore you to enjoy your lunch while you can, <laughs> as long as you can hold it down with those numbers. We, would, we could also see a recession uh, in the next few years that could put further pressure on our debt to GDP. And it can happen in a nanosecond, and it did in the last financial crisis. And, a, and according to the parliamentary budget officer who re released a report a couple of weeks ago, Ontario's current fiscal policies are not sustainable over the long term. Quebec and BC received a clean bill of health to be able to fund health care in an environment where 42% of our government spending is not only on health care, but it's one of our fastest items because of the aging population. And this is another sobering part, uh, report, a third party report that says, Ontario, you are not fiscally sustainable. You cannot take care of the people you most need to take care of. And it's a bit more than that because our aging population, the health care costs are back ended, but retiring people pay less in tax and consume less. So we have a headwind of GDP as well. So these numbers are very sobering. And my message to you today is that that should be a wake-up call for all Ontarians. Now, prior to entering public life, I, I spent my time uh, evaluating financial risk, and some people ask me if the line-by-line -line items that I see on Ontario's balance sheet keep me up at night, and I say no. I sleep like a baby. I wake up every hour and I cry. But I want the rest of you not to cry. That's what we're hard at work in the government of Ontario. Um, my experience at DBRS, Dominion Bond Rating Service, the credit rating agency, gave me a unique insight into sovereign credit ratings. As I mentioned, that my team led reviews for sovereigns, sovereigns and subnationals. And in 2009, during the fiscal crisis, our team downgraded the, uh, the credit rating of this province. And what I learned is that credit is not infinite. Uh, governments cannot assume that markets have limitless appetite for public debt. As some European countries found out the hard way during the financial crisis, and make no mistake, some countries today are finding out. You don't have to go very far to see some big EU countries that are in a fiscal uh, tight, tight situation. That's why I call our financial situ situation here in Ontario the challenge for our generation. Now, I think it's fair to say, given my business background, that we need to bring the language of business to the business of government. And it's one of the reasons I put my name on the ballot in the first place. And it's why I consider myself particularly fortunate 
to, be, to have been asked by Premier Ford to serve as the Treasury Board President, where this discipline can be good, put to good use. Now, for example, at the Treasury Board, we have driven, driven rigor through the whole operation by establishing, for the first time, a terms of reference. This work is vital because through it, we can hold each ministry, including the Ministry of Education, including the Ministry of Education, Conservation Parks, and all 20 ministries, to account for their spending, spending and measure performance against the dollars spent. In fact, we need to change the previous Liberal government's ethos of measuring success based on, not by measuring ethos based on the dollars spent, to, but rather to one measuring results achieved. But efficiency is not a goal in and of itself. Efficiency is the means. This, the goal is structural balance and a more sustainable government. That is what we were elected to do. Not just fulfill a balance sheet commitment, but to ensure that the vital services people expect across this province rely on, uh, that we meet their needs. If we do not take action to reduce debt and the deficit, our generation and the next are at serious risk of jeopardizing core services. So the first part of the problem is acknowledging that there is a problem. I am concerned by some public commentary that I've heard that calls into question the veracity of the deficit numbers provided by the Independent Commission of Inquiry. Let me be clear. The fall economic statement will not present any about face from what we have learned from the Commission. A $15 billion deficit is, in fact, the baseline from which we are oper operating. You need only to consider by presenting the true $15 billion deficit for the first time in three years, we achieved an unqualified, clean opinion from the Auditor General. Those are the first steps in restoring trust, accountability, and transparency to the people of Ontario. Because the threat to our fiscal health as a result of Liberal mismanagement is very real and very severe. Now, we are in the midst of a, of a meaningful expenditure management exercise that will, first and foremost, consider how we can do things in government differently. It's a challenge not born of ideology. Folks, this is a challenge born on math. The numbers tell the story. If I told you I was taking out a third mortgage, that I was going on multiple holidays with my family, spending more money every year, you might advise me that this is not prudent, and that I might lead, that might lead to significant financial issues, and you would be right. Like families, we cannot spend more than we take in indefinitely. And this is the real challenge of our time. But we have before us an opportunity to transform public finances that we can take this opportunity that we cannot squander. This is a province-building moment. And let me repeat that. This is a province-building moment that, if done right, will see a sustainable Ontario for this generation and future generations. Now, the line-by-line -line review led by EY Canada, someone right there, um, dug into 15 years of financial records. And I do want to acknowledge Mark McDonald and the team who did an outstanding job in doing the line-by-line -line review. What the report found that had expenditures increased in line with the population growth, the, the government from 15 years, 2003 to 2018, would have spent $330 billion less. That's almost equal to the total debt of this province. The review also accompanied, was accompanied by a consultation which we called Planning for Prosperity. And I'm really proud to say that over a three-week period, we received 26,000 ideas from people not only in the Ontario Public Service, but also from Ontarians. Ontarians were enthusiastic to contribute to ideas that would lead to easier, more accessible, and instant interaction with government. And the largest number of ideas were submitted, that were submitted were focused on trying to improve things like Service Ontario. So with this information, we now have an opportunity to reshape the customer experience for Ontarians into a modern one. And I think it's important to pause on that customer experience, whether I was TD Bank or, or my previous employer, everything was around the customer experience or the user experience. Now we'll call it the citizen experience. Other jurisdictions have done that. We need to modernize and transform and put the lens of government around the citizen and not the lens around the product. 
So when people hear me talk about modernization, transformation, uh, and digitization, they often think that I'm talking about massive projects, and, and we, we are, and we will talk more about that. But let me give you two examples where the little things also add up. When we first were, uh, when I was first appointed minister, um, uh, and we put our staff together, and a terrific staff, I think I got the, some of the best people in all of Ontario. Uh, some of the people asked me uh, when they got their cell phone what the other thing on their desk was, and that was a landline. I, and uh, most of them actually waited for a ring. It doesn't ring, so we decided to cut the cord, not cut frontline workers, we cut the cord, and my ministry, a uh, political staff of 12 people, the savings will be about $8,000 a year. Now, if you think about multiplying that through the whole department, I think we have about 1,700 people in Treasury Board, another 68,000 in the Ontario Public Service, another 700,000 people in the broader public service. Those thousands start to turn into hundreds of thousands that turn into millions, and that's a duplication. Everyone's using their phone more and more. The landline, it doesn't even ring. And use, it rang once, and it was uh, one of the uh, CRA scams from India. <laughs> Not a good call for them to get to me. Um, I'm also here to announce today that uh, a new step uh, uh, undertaken by the Treasury Board Secretariat, one that has been in the works for some time, and much, one that we, we hope to proliferate across all of government, much like the landlines. And since taking office, I asked my officials to go paperless uh, to meetings and briefings where possible. The result has been an 86 percent reduction in binders mailed out to Treasury Board meetings in addition to other briefings. Let me tell you folks, if you took all the binders I get and all the briefings stacked in front of me and if I sprinkled some snow on it, I'd be able to ski off of it. Um, what's the result? Uh, the savings in pe paper, printing costs, staff costs, and staff time, and staff working days totals $26,000 per year. Now again, if you just multiply that out, you can get a, a sense of how we are beginning the process of thinking differently in government. This is in addition to, and I really like this part, 17 trees and 54 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions, all from this one ministry alone. You know, the ENY report also identified bigger structural challenges, and you'll have to hear from Vic Fidelli next week as we begin to tackle those big things in the fall economic statement. So stay tuned for that. But let me highlight one thing that we're, we're doing. Take old-style corporate welfare, which remains a drain on public finances and an, un, un, sorry, an unsustainable and efficient approach to employment. Our government campaigned on ending the Liberal Party's Job Prosperity Fund, which was pork barrel politics at its worst. Instead, when we say open for business, we mean open for everybody. There is a role for a government in creating uh, jobs or encouraging job creation, whether it is by using the tax system to incent investment or cutting red tape and the regulatory burden. But the days of governments handing out taxpayer checks to hand-picked companies with no accountability for job creation or results, those days are over. Here, but here is an example of where government and the business community can work more closely together by tapping the skills and experiences of the brightest to make government more effective. That's why today, I'm also pleased and really excited to announce that our government will be launching the Planning for Prosperity Advisory Group. This group of independent and respected experts will support the government's transformation agenda by providing their ideas on delivering programs and services in a way that promises the best value for the people of Ontario. The non-paid advisors, I'm quite frugal, the non-paid advisors will provide independent advice to government on opportunities for innovation and change so that we can achieve sustainability and begin to start the process to balance the budget. And we look forward to hearing their novel, trailblazing ideas on how to implement the changes that will make government work better for Ontarians. We need to put the structures in place that create a culture of productivity and efficiency. Bless you. That is why, no matter what difficulty or obstacle, uh, we will transform government into a modern institution that sustains and serves the people of Ontario. 
We all know that diet fads don't work. Similar to instituting broad program cuts is not the answer. Cuts may achieve a short-term gain, but in the long run, that spending will return. Our exercise of expenditure management is about protecting the core services of government. Not doing so hurts our most vulnerable and reduces our ab ability to invest in what matters. We will put the people at the centre of every service, every regulation, every program, every process and every policy. That is our promise to you. Together we will restore trust, accountability and transparency into the province's finances. Transforming the culture of government will allow us to do that. After all, the proper management of public finances is not just a fiscal imperative, it is a moral imperative. We will protect frontline services and we will ensure that our province is modern and fiscally sustainable for this generation and future generations. Thank you. That was a fantastic speech. Um, you, you've agreed to take some Q&A questions, is that right? Absolutely. Rod did it last week, so I better... Uh... Amazing. Okay. So we have two mics, uh, Marie and Bill. Bill over here and Marie over here have mics. So uh, do we have any questions? Uh, anyone? I'm going to ask the first question while people are thinking. So you've talked about a lot of the stuff that's tough, like the hard stuff, but you've been in, in politics since June now. What's the funnest or the, the most fun moment you've had so far in, in your job and, and whether it be in your role as MPP or whether your role in Treasury Board? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Kent. That is, uh, that's a great question. You know, after I got elected, you know, our Premier, uh, man, he's a, he's a good guy and he's got street smarts. But what really, really impressed me about him was his responsiveness to, I guess you'd say, customers and putting the customer or the citizen first. And... Um, I've really embraced that, and I remember someone gave me a call, and uh, I guess I returned the call right away, and they had a problem, and I fixed it. And I bumped into this person about a month later, and they basically tackled me and said, the guy's name was Ron in Pickering. And he said, uh, do you remember me? My name's Ron so-and-so. And I said, not really, I apologize. He said, well, you, you returned my call within 24 hours, you fixed my problem, and I've told everyone in my neighborhood what you did. And I thought, if that doesn't get you up in the morning, and that's how, what government, and that's what public service is all about, um, I think that's probably the most, the, one of the most rewarding things about being in government and public service. The opportunity to do something to help others, and not even getting any reward. I, I was just fortunate to bump into that person, so I got a little psychic reward for that. Um, but when you have the opportunity to impact people's lives, uh, it's something that I've never experienced in the same way in the private sector. And uh, I know Bill Davis said once uh, his uh, best day at Tory, his worst day in government was better than his best day at Tories. Um, and um, I, can, I can attest to that. It's really an empowering and, and fulfilling type of role, which I see my colleagues shaking their head. I, I'd, be, I'd be shocked if the rating agency didn't have any questions. Over here. <laughs> When are you going to balance the budget? That would be a good one. Sorry. Over here. Sorry, Minister. Okay, could you give your name, please, and your, and your organization? That'd be great. Sure. Julie Garner from Earnscliff. Um, thanks so much for your speech today, Minister. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on the Planning for Prosperity advisory that you talked about, what the scope will be, and how to feed in ideas. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, the Planning for Prosperity advisory group, um, you know, one of the things when you transform uh, a machine, the government machine, it means uh, big culture change. And a lot of organizations, um, both uh, in the public sector and the private sector, have engaged in cultural change as you transform. Um, so we've picked a group of people who have experience in transforming uh, cultures. And it's hard work and it takes time. There's also, uh, with regard to the, um, the challenge at hand, a list of things that maybe aren't as catchy. The opposition always asked me about, uh, isn't the Ernst & Young report all about just privatizing LCBO and OLG and uh, OPG? And my response was, Mr. Speaker, OMG. 
Um, you, you know, re really, you know, the Ernst & Young report really highlights a lot of things are, that are less catchy. Uh, things like uh, procurement and back office efficiency and maybe digitization is pretty, pretty interesting. Business supports, uh, a range of things uh, that ros work workforce rostering, um, the list goes on. And so it's good to have a sounding board uh, from a range of people uh, that include people who have been in federal, provincial, and municipal areas and in the private sector, not-for-profit sector, and part of the broader public service and part of the former, uh, or the, the public service, to get that cross-section of, of experiences. I'm a big believer in uh, tapping into other people's experiences, particularly those when you make mistakes. I always like to ask, what worked well and what would you have done differently if you had the opportunity? And I've been very fortunate in my career to have, uh, you know, I think as uh, Kent was mentioning, um, former Minister of uh, Finance, uh, Mike Wilson, and others to kind of counsel me, and, and they have tremendous experiences to share. So this, this advisory board will, will do that in part, and the mandate is really to advise the President of the Treasury Board over the next few years on the massive modernization and transformation program to get another perspective. Hello, Minister. Uh, Dr. Sarah Diamond, President of Oakhead University, I had the uh, pleasure of uh, being in your roundtable at the Ontario Economic Summit. Um, I just wanted to underscore the power of um, students in terms of their ability to play a really um, transformational role in helping to think through the kinds of changes that you want to bring about and to underscore um, the value of universities and, and college students as interns, as thinkers, as individuals who are very knowledgeable about the digital transformation and uh, to really encourage you to think about that talent um, and ways that um, we can work with you closely and your government to ensure that that next generation of, um, of individuals is really integrated into the kinds of changes you want to see happen in this province. I think you've got very willing partners here. Well, thank you for that comment. And if I can just extrapolate a, a little bit, I think the, the education I mentioned, K-12 to and, and math and science and technology, uh, the work that I'm so proud of our government, uh, mm -hmm. Bill 148, uh, uh, and, and the pace of change that was so tough for many employers to, to absorb. And the Council of Trades, uh, or College of Trades, I should say, when you have such a clear and present deficit of trades and in, in employers looking for that, um, I've had the fortune to, to tour so many places. Uh, the other day I was with the Durham Regional Police um, and they have uh, automated their evidence taking um, equipment. It used to be that uh, everything was collected through D DVDs and then shipped to the Crown and it was laborious, administrative, etc. By embracing technology, which is by the way secure and safe, um, they've reduced the error rate massively uh, they've freed up administrative time to be able to deliver um, uh, evidence in a more timely basis, which is fair for both the prosecution and the defense. I also, uh, I see Dr. Ruben Devlin here. I had the fortune of, of uh, touring the Humber River Hospital. Again, not a single piece of paper. Everything is interoperable. Uh, robots, uh, robotics have been embraced. Big data has been embraced. And Artificial intelligence, it's coming, and Toronto is a massive hub that we have right under our noses, a tremendous opportunity to really lever and harness the power of big data and predictive power, and, and wouldn't government who has so much data, we have to deal with it securely, we have to deal with it on a private basis, but the amount of opportunity to leverage that, and hospitals like Humber River are using that as a tool to manage the flow and deliver a better patient outcome at a lower price point while reducing infection rates, while reducing errors in administering medicine. I mean, this is the future. And to really embrace the future here in Ontario, our kids have to be strong in science, technology, engineering, math, and the arts, the STEAM. We have to, we have to equip them. And that includes both the trades uh, who now use technology as a big part of their jobs. Uh, and the stigma should leave uh, I think it's time that we really um, let go the stigma that the trades isn't a rewarding and, and fulfilling and a good paying job with high level skills. I think it's the white collar job of tomorrow. 
and that we've got to embrace uh, the talent deficit that we have in the, in the technology sector. So I'll, I, um, I really think, thank you for those comments, but uh, we obviously feel passionate about that in government, and we'll do what we can to, to assist that process. Okay, I think that's okay. it. Okay, thank you. I'm pleased to welcome Kelly Jackson, the Associate Vice President of Government Relations, Marketing and Communications from Humber College, and a director of the Empire Club of Canada to the podium. Thank you. So I have the honor today on behalf of the Empire Club of Canada of thanking our speaker, Minister Bethan Falvey. Uh, today you've painted a very clear picture for us of the state of Ontario's finances. Um, you've helped us to start to understand what those steps are your government is taking to put the province on a sustainable financial footing. And I think it's very clear from your remarks that it's not just about being open for business, but it's about open for ideas. And I love that message about, you know, what is possible. And I think everybody here is walking away today not thinking about necessarily just the challenge, but what are those ideas that we have from all of our various organizations and sectors? How can we bring those forward? Whether it's those very small examples you gave us that multiply and have big impact, or whether it's the very large, bigger structural things that we can start to imagine. Um, from everyday citizens to the people in this room who often come and talk to you and your colleagues in their offices about different ideas, um, or to your new expert panel of advisors on transformation, it's clear you're listening, it's clear you're open to ideas, and I want to say thank you for your time today. Thanks, Kelly. Finally, we look forward to welcoming uh, anyone here who got the sold-out tickets to the Mancinelli event tomorrow. There's a number of great events we have up. We have the Federal Environment Minister in December coming up to answer to, uh, uh, from the speech from Rod Phillips from last week. We have uh, anyone who would like to hear Lisa Thompson come to the Empire Club. You should probably clap your hands. I'm gonna... So we're, we're hoping to have Lisa in the new year, and we're, we're, uh, we're, we're, we'll be working with, with her. Uh, we also have uh, Michael Katchen, the co-founder of CEO Well Sim Simple, on the 21st. We have a great healthcare event this month. There's tons of events up, so please take a look and, and come. And then Monday night we have a, a kind of a post-Toronto election political panel. Uh, it, it's an evening event. It's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a, at a very small venue for any of you who want to come out. So thank you, and that, that's pretty much. Thank thank you for joining us today, and the meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>